experience. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just give you a brief uh, introduction to Village Health for South Sudan and uh, the, the organization and some of the project work that we've done and why I think the uh, CSI uh, energy solution would kind of fit into the, the project model that we already use. And then after I do this introduction, then Mo will talk about the energy plans. I, I know nothing about uh, the energy side of this. I'm just kind of a project manager. So Village Health for South Sudan is a 501c3 charity that uh, I founded in 2007. We actually started working in South Sudan earlier than that, but we were uh, fortunate enough to be a project or a program uh, uh, that was sponsored by a church in the Boston area. And so for the first year or nine months or so, uh, we were able to collect, you know, start getting the word out and collecting donations, starting with the church community and then uh, eventually others heard about us. And, but those contributions were going to the church. But in 2007, we really wanted to form our own organization, so we created the 501c3. And the mission of uh, Village Help for South Sudan is kind of simplistically to help remote villages in South Sudan undertake their own development work. And I think you know, that's kind of what everybody is talking about. You know, at the time we formed Village Help for South Sudan, it kind of felt like everybody else was doing development work the wrong way. None of us were development experts. I've never taken an international development course until yesterday morning, and I feel like, wow, that was you pretty incredible. You haven't passed it yet. No, I know. <laughs> and I don't really bring down those credentials. But it seemed like at the time we formed Village Health for South Sudan, that we were going to be doing something that no other organizations in South Sudan were doing. All of the other organizations, and, and virtually all NGOs, international NGOs that you can think of are engaged in South Sudan. They were all doing things at the town level and they were, you know, setting up their own expensive compounds with air conditioned housing, you know, walled in. And they were uh, bringing in their own staff members at, you know, high salaried uh, people to do the work. And so, even though it seems somewhat unique at the time, obviously we are in good company here, and it's just wonderful to, you know, to collaborate this way with others. Uh, I'll also mention SAFTA, which stands for South Sudan American Friendship and Trade Association. After <coughs> doing this mission, a charity mission, for a number of years since 2006, uh, about a year ago, we basically, when South Sudan became the dependent, a lot of uh, the country opened up to foreign trade in ways that it hadn't been opened before. When South Sudan was part of the whole Sudan, there uh, there have been sanctions, U.S. sanctions and you know Western sanctions on you know foreign investments and doing business in South Sudan. You could do charity work in South Sudan, and you could uh, you could do you know banking if you had a bank that didn't wasn't based in Khartoum and so on, but. Uh, when South Sudan became independent, then opportunities opened up for foreign investment. And so that's when we started kind of transitioning in our own thinking of uh, trying to develop uh, on a small scale at the start uh, the private sector, but still assisting with the needs of villagers as opposed to you know, large business uh, you know, business people, or inviting large foreign investment for their own profits. You know, we really wanted to still work on the needs of South Sudan at the remote or rural level, but try to find ways that we could do it in a private sector or for-profit uh, manner. Uh, and, you know, in a way, I, I kind of feel you know, from my own experience, I feel like, I, as I said, I'm getting far more from this than I have to offer. But, uh, you know, and I have more than one sort of crisis of confidence this week, wondering, you know, do I, should I really be here? Because, you know, we're at the very beginning stages of kind of trying to work out the for-profit model, but, you know, hopefully we can 
uh, fast track some of this, you know, based on the collaboration that we're doing. And you can't see this very well, but uh, turn away that off. Maybe. You know, I I always start when I talk about village health for South Sudan with pictures of a typical village. And when we talk about villages in South Sudan, there's sort of, you know, different levels of or concentrations of population. And rural villages, remote villages, really have no infrastructure or services at all. And the people who live there have been living this way for generations. You know, some, uh, most observers kind of look at South Sudan in general and say that there's, you know, except for pockets of development, there really has been, has been no development in South Sudan for you know, centuries. So the people in the remote areas are still living the way you know, they have been for you know, generations. So this is a, a typical homestead, and this is the place that I stayed on my first trip to South Sudan. And you know, this family was incredibly generous to invite us to stay there. No, they didn't have a spare room, they had no spare beds, but we brought tents, and so we pitched our tents in their yard, and uh, this is the cooking fire <coughs> in, the, in the dry season. All cooking is done on this kind of fire, in the wet season it's moved into the, you know, inside. Uh, we were, in addition to spending, you know, nights there, we, uh, we also, you know, ate food that was prepared on this fire, and, you know, the first night we arrived, we got there sort of at not at dark, but maybe an hour or so before it got dark. And so virtually all of the food preparation and cooking was done in the dark, you know, over this fire. And, you know, they slaughtered a goat, they made bread from uh, a grain called sorghum. I don't know if you're, I mean, in the U.S. we don't use sorghum all that much, but it's very, it's a very common grain. And so, and the sorghum is ground by hand in kind of a mortar and pestle type device. So the the girls primarily will spend hours grinding grain using this, you know, mortar and pestle method. And so, you know, we had this wonderful bread that was made with sorghum and a goat stew and this is the way, you know, I first was introduced to uh, South Sudan. So this is a typical village and whenever I kind of think about, you know, why am I you know, initially, when you go to a place like this, you, you see so much need that it's kind of hard to figure out, okay, what, you know, where do you start? And, you know, you feel kind of powerless to, uh, to do anything. And I think that's why, you know, we tend to turn to God and, you know, you know turn, you look for sources of wisdom elsewhere. But also, whenever I think about, you know, my involvement with uh, South Sudan seems so insignificant, you know, I sort of come back to this picture and remember, you know, the hospitality and, uh, you know, the incredible gift that this poor family, uh, you know, offered us. And so it's, it's pretty incredible. And as you can imagine, even, you know, food and water are scarce. Uh, many villages, in fact, prob it's probably still the majority of villages in the remote areas, you know, still don't have clean water. And the only clean water that's uh, typically available is through boreholes and hand pumps. And so it's quite costly to install clean water in most locations. And you know the government takes no responsibility for this. So all water installations are the responsibility of humanitarian aid. And so because we recognize the need for clean water, uh, initially when we went there, that became the first thing we you know, we did is, you know, the, the village kind of, uh, you know, the sort of informal governing structure in the village is, you know, there are village chiefs and leaders and there's always, you know, community meetings and the community sort of decides, you know, how things are done and they had sort of decided their own priorities and uh, first was clean water and then the second was uh, to build a school. And this is a, a typical classroom. Uh, this village without a school, without a brick and mortar building, uh, conducts classes outside in the shade of a tree. And this is, you know, actually quite 
you know, a little better furnished than a lot of classrooms are because it has benches <laughs> that are made out of sticks. But, you know, so this town, in spite of the fact, in spite of the, you know, lack of infrastructure and services and, and the incredible poverty, you know, they really wanted a school building. And one of the reasons for wanting a building is you know, a couple of things. Uh, when classes are conducted outside, they're not, they don't hold classes when it gets too hot and they don't hold classes in the rain. So the learning, you know, the school year gets very short. And so with a, a building, you can actually conduct classes the whole school year. Uh, this village actually had teachers. Uh, some of them are only educated up to, say, the fifth grade level, but they would be the ones who would teach, you know, the lower grades. And some of them actually have gone all the way through high school. There are no teachers that have advanced education beyond high school, but that's okay. We, uh, the school this community wanted uh, to build was a primary school, not a high school, so it was well suited for uh, bringing the classes inside and using the teachers that they already had. And then the other thing that happens when a school is built is that the Ministry of Education and the government then recognizes it as a school and they start paying the teachers. So that was a big incentive for them to have a a building. When teachers are teaching outside under trees, they don't get paid. Mm -hmm. The village also, in addition, and I'll show you pictures of the construction of the school, but they also uh, constructed the furniture. So these, you know, incredibly beautiful desks. It's hard to see uh, in, in pictures, but this is beautiful wood. It's a local wood that the village got permission from the uh, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, Department of Forestry, I think, to actually cut down these trees. And they cut the lumber by hand, and you know, a local carpenter made the desks. And so, you know, just a couple of examples of you know, the village kind of doing their own work as opposed to having it done for them. Now, some of the students in this class are not wearing uniforms, but uh, you know, after you build a school and then provide the furniture, the next thing you have to provide uh, is our uniforms. Uh, we've also done limited teacher training and adult literacy. You know, we don't spend all that much time, whether it's people from the West don't spend all that much time in the village. So what we try to do, as opposed to us providing the training ourselves, is we just find local uh, you know, who's doing teacher training in the area. And we'll find ways of, you know, assisting the teachers to go and attend that training. But when we do go, we have a, uh, you know, certified teacher on, you know, who works with us and goes and, and she can conduct, uh, you know, certain, you know, limited teacher training. And this, this is kind of interesting because this was before the school was built, and this is actually a uh, fabric called chalk cloth. I don't know if it's it's it has. It looks like fabric. It looks like it's folded. It folded. Yeah, so it's it works just like a chalkboard, but it's fabric, so it's very easy to fold up and and take with you. Uh, and it's this is this is pinned on. Uh, it's inside the church in this village, and the church is built in the traditional uh, method as well. So these are. Kind of, mud and, and stick walls, but it's very easy to kind of put up, you know, hang from a tree or on, you know, whatever surface is available. So these are the uniforms that the, uh, that the village uh, created themselves. You know, once again, you know, we, we didn't want to provide uniforms <coughs> that were imported from someplace else. We wanted, uh, you know, all of the projects that we do, we want the, uh, the local uh, community to do the, the work themselves. And so, you know, there was fabric available in the marketplace. There were tailors available who used treble sewing machines to sew. And so it was pretty easy for the community to find the resources that they needed to uh, make their own uniforms. So this is the official uniform of the, the school. I like how some of those children can grow into that uniform over the course of five years. <laughs> right, well, that's, that was one, one of the size things. All. I mean, that, you know, there are <laughs> tiny head. little kids who are wearing a uniform that's way too big for them, but that's the reason. And, and also, 
uh, you know, it's kind of an ongoing process because, in, you know, hand-me-downs are not really, you know, that commonly accepted. So it's, you know, there's a, a process of replacing uniforms as needed. What does the uniform cost? Do you know? We did this so long ago, I don't remember what the cost was. Uh, but it's not that much to get the fabric and hire the tailor to do it. This is our project manager. This is a guy, you know, assuming a role like Mo is assuming in his village. Uh, he's a you know, member, he's a citizen of this community, one of the school. He was actually educated in Uganda, so he has a high school diploma. But he worked as our project manager. And this is uh, Yell shopping in the marketplace for fabric for the uniforms. And then these are the tailors that were hired to sew the uniforms. And sewing and tailoring is actually one of the adult vocations that you know will be you know pursued because there is, you know, you can imagine with more and more schools being built, there's an opportunity to you know create more uniforms and and you know so we, we have a we're working on the project now in, in another community uh, that's going to provide adult education and vocational training using, uh, you know, local talent, and tailoring actually will be a part of that. So, you know, our funds will, our grant will enable them to get the sewing machines, put them in the adult learning center, and then you know, hiring a tailor to teach uh, men and women to uh, sew these uniforms. And other things. This is a typical four classroom block. The particular school that you know I was talking about has two four classroom blocks. It's a total of eight classrooms. Uh, but this is very typical in South Sudan when a school is built in a village. I suspect this looks very similar to the school that you're working on now in, in view. And it was a surprise to me when I first went there after it was built and I saw the flag poles. I didn't really, but that's a place to flag the, uh, to flag the uh, South Sudan flag and the, the state flag. This is, you know, just a couple of pictures about the, the process of making bricks. Once again, using, you know, local asset-based community development, I guess. Um, so these are, Bricks that are made in the so-called traditional way, and you know, initially, you know, I thought this is being clay that's going to crumble and fall apart. But you know, it, it actually re results in bricks that are as you know solid and hard because they are actually fired. Uh, so this is the process of making bricks by hand. It employs many people in the community. The you know the the chief brick maker is you know handling the clay and then. These other people have uh, will take the form. Each form, I think, produces uh, four bricks, and they'll run. They, they, I, you know, I've watched this, and you know, it's just amazing how fast they run. And this is in uh, a temperature of probably around 110 degrees. It's incredibly hot, and these guys will work literally, you know, all day long. So those aren't kiln fired at all. They are. I'll, I'll just. So this is another view of the process, you know, of how, you know, the, the brick making uh, station is fabricated and then it's used to, uh, oh, it's, the forms make two bricks at a time. Mm -hmm. And it uses a lot of water, as you can imagine. Uh, and so unfortunately, that the only uh, source of water, there's no river and no surface water in this village, so it involves pumping water from the ground, which is also very labor intensive. This is the firing mound. It's not, the bricks are not fired in a, a kiln. The way they do it is they stack the bricks in mounds and they leave fire chambers open. And then the entire mound is covered with mud. And then fire is burned in these chambers. So the, the villagers will gather the wood for the fire and keep feeding 
wood into these chambers and keeping the fire going for about five days. So it uses a lot of resources and fortunately there's ample uh, clay and there's ample wood right now. I worry about this, you know, long term because it does, uh, you know, use a lot of brush and wood and stuff. And so, you know, you have to worry about, you know, losing that resource. But I think more and more uh, villages will turn to uh, cement blocks, which unfortunately, of course, that requires importing the cement. There's no cement factory in South Sudan, so it means that you're importing the cement from a neighboring country. And then, uh, you know, you're still using a lot of water and sand and stuff like that. And then, so basically the brick making process is forming the bricks, they're laid out in the sun, they're sun dried, then they're stacked in these mounds, then they're fired, and then when you're ready, when the fire is, after they cool, then they're ready to be used for construction. And this is a few pictures of another uh, uh, project that uses bricks and it just kind of shows the walls of this building going on. And this building is actually a village uh, clinic. It's kind of interesting. Uh, villages are pretty much neglected by the state government until they actually have a so-called facility. So just as schools, you know, teachers start getting paid when they're teaching in classrooms, uh, clinics st start getting recognized by the Ministry of Health. And uh, th this clinic, is in the same village as that other school, and this so this village is actually quite transformed, but not in a way that kind of Western designers have determined, but the way the you know the village wanted their their village to change. I'm, I'm impressed with the quality of the brickwork. No, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's this is all done with local resources. And and what kind of flooring is it going to go? It's a cement floor, so it uses a lot of cement, unfortunately. Uh, even when you make bricks, I mean, it does reduce the amount of cement needed because, uh, somewhat. But uh, in addition to you know cement in the foundation and on the floors, all of the mortar, of course, is made with cement. And then the inside and outside of the walls are mortared with cement. So it still does use a lot of resources that are not. But without covering the whole thing with cement during the rainy season, it just wouldn't hold up. So. It ends up being very, uh, very solid once it's. Did they use rebar in the foundation? Yes, and that's another thing that's not available. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's available in the marketplace locally, but it's imported from you know outside the country. And this is the the clinic uh, structure and the, the roofing going up. And this is the clinic that's finished. It's not at at this point. It's not painted, but you can see how it's covered with. Cement, the windows are installed. Where do they get the, um, the boulders from? Are they all villages in, in the village? The what? The boulders. Uh, yeah, the, uh, in, in this case, we hired a, a builder who uh, was not right from this town, but was available in the area, and that builder had built other schools, and so it just seemed like, you know, the villagers were able to find that builder. They, you know, are the project manager. You know, negotiated the contract and all of that. In in uh, Mo's case, he he also found builders that were in the area. And so one of the things that results from these projects is not only does the project itself uh, pay all of the labor, the local labor force who work on it, but they also learn new skills. And so many of the laborers that work on projects like this have since gone on. In fact, these builders that Mo found, you know, started working as laborers and now they have their own construction company. Now, they, the funding for these buildings came from your organization? Yes. But then once they're here, so you build a school, you build a clinic, now the government starts paying teachers and people to staff the clinic, is that right? Uh, yes, that's the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> sometimes we're still, they show up, sometimes they don't. That's very definitely true for the teachers. In the case of the clinic, uh, 
right now the clinic is only used informally because we're still working on the uh, furnish the, the furnishings and the equipment for the clinic. But we, you know, that's another project that we are just starting. And once it is equipped and and uh, you know has the furniture, the beds, and you know exam rooms, and it was you know one of the biggest health issues in South Sudan is our, our maternal and newborn uh, mortality rates. And so one of the big services that will be provided out of clinics like this at the village level are you know, midwife type services. And so yes, the Ministry of Health would then be more or less forced to uh, provide services. And, and so at that stage, you've got some influx of cash coming into that community. Right, because a clinic you know, has a revenue model because patients who come you know, do pay the nurse for or whatever treatment they get. Even at the village level, this is not this is not a sophisticated hospital, so it'll never do surgery and things like that. People would still have to travel to the nearest <laughs> hospital, which is you know four hours away. But what do you do for lighting and things inside? Well, right now uh, the village, all on their own, they found a an organization that was installing uh, solar lighting, and so. Lighting has been installed. Uh, it's not a uh, as sophisticated a system as you know, the sun laser and so on. It, and they have you know just small. Um, uh, Is it a we care solar panels? Conditions? Pardon me. I would they call it we care solar. Could be. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, this was really quite interesting. How you know once you start mobilizing the community, and it's not quite as you know it just really was moved by the process that you know, Torchbearers uses, but uh, even in the <coughs> formal way, you know, once a community starts getting sort of recognized and starts you know, this, down this path of self-mobilization, you know, they are really good at finding resources to you know, make their own improvements. And so when you know, we visited the first time it was done and saw the solar installed, we were completely surprised. But uh, this would, and Mo will talk more about this later, but this is one uh, type of use of the sun blazer that we were thinking is, you know, supporting the energy needs of a clinic. And this type of village clinic doesn't have super high energy needs because, you know, they're not running heavy equipment and, you know, mostly it's going to be used for uh, small uh, exam equipment like ultrasound and go well, out of time. Two minute warning. Okay. <coughs> These are some of the traditional birth attendants who, you know, we were beginning to support them in a, in a small way, but because maternal and child health is such a huge uh, issue, it, uh, I think South Sudan has the, uh, you know, the worst indicators in the world right now for, uh, you know, the number of mothers who die giving birth and, you know, the number of uh, children who die, you know, before age two. We work a lot with weak care so hard. Bringing light to the midwives, just like the local right. Stuff. Yeah. We did that. Right. We it, we've been providing midwife kits, uh, you know, just kind of on a small scale in church. Like, that, did they have the headlight? Uh, well, we haven't actually started providing the lights yet, but we are looking into that. And there's an organization that Mo uh, located in, I think it's Santa Barbara, who it's called uh, Unite to Light, yeah. and they also provide uh, lighting for midwife kits. So there are a number of organizations right now that I've heard of that are providing, you know, lights for midwives. And this is just another example of how uh, some villagers get their water. You know, sometimes it's just... Pardon me? How deep is that It's extremely deep. And, you know, it's got these this kind of ledge that people, you know, climb down to, you know, to reach the water. And then they get water like this in buckets, and that's what they drink. And, you know, whenever I look at this, you know, the first thing is, you know, total disgust that people would actually have to be forced to drink this kind of water. And it is, but then somebody else pointed out to me that it's probably not as bad as it looks because it's been filtered through all of the clay. But unfortunately, it's surface water. So anything that's on the ground, you know, in a free-ranging society, and on the defecation society, everything goes into the water. So it's never going to be, uh, you know, a clean source of water. But this is what, you know, they're stuck with. And these are just a few pictures of the way the borehole is installed. Um, this is a drilling rig that will, you know, you can 
higher in the local area, and it will come in, drill the borehole, and install these hand pumps. Is it going to a lower water level, or is it yes. the same? So is no, it no, no, it's going through water. Is it? Yeah, it's going down to the uh, aquifer. And yeah, it goes down about 15 meters. Yeah, fortunately, South Sudan is fairly flat. There are some areas where you have to go deeper to get to the aquifer, but it's pretty consistent across the country, as far as I know. And this is, you know, I just put this picture here because agriculture is another use that we saw for, uh, you know, for solar uh, pumping, you know, both to replace hand pumps with, uh, with solar pumps uh, and some kind of a system that makes it less labor intensive for people to get water and for uh, irrigation. Right now, crops are only grown during the rainy season. I think that's very typical in lots of places. But if you could extend the growing season through irrigation then, and maybe do irrigation through pumping water um, in some way, either using the, what was the? Treadle pumps. The treadle pumps or, uh, or a solar pump, you know, then I think that would help. And this is a, uh, an example of a solar installation that <laughs> this was in one village, and so somebody happened to you know get a hold of a uh, you know solar panel and hooked it up to a car battery, and you know, found that kind of interesting. Uh, and then early on when we started going there, I brought this. It was this is a village that's completely there's no cell phone access, there's no communication outside, so we really wanted to be able to. Uh, connect to our blog and things like that from the village. So I brought this solar, uh, it's a solar powered uh, satellite modem, basically. I don't know if you've ever seen these before. How much is your internet access cost on that? On this, it's very expensive. Uh, and you kind of pay as you go. You have to reload the, the account every time. So it's fine for short duration, but I ended up leaving this set up and, and training somebody, you know, the project manager on how to use it. And very soon, you know, <laughs> I think they, they were kind of using way more minutes than, you know, our budget could afford, so we're not really using that. And since then, anyway, uh, this, the, the little uh, oh, USB, right. USB yeah. and so to get to the internet with those, you can't, you couldn't do it from this village because there's no cell phone signal, but you know, a two-hour walk away, you could get to a cell phone. So that that's much more reasonable. It's it's much cheaper. What did that rig cost? Uh, I think it was about. I think the modem was about four hundred dollars, and the battery pack and the solar panel and so on was another three hundred maybe. What what communication side? Oh, that's using uh, the satellite provider that's. Based in, in that part, it's called Thoraya, and there, I, I forgot the rate. So there's already a coverage. Yes, yeah. There are two. Uh, it's Thoraya and another one. I forgot the name of the other satellite that's available. On that. But this is a little cheaper. But it's very expensive. <laughs> 